Hey everyone, how are you doing today? As mentioned in our daily financial news, we do our expert series with Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing very well, Matt. So you brought an exciting report produced by McKinsey. Uh, we're going to talk about the future of work, kind of how those pieces lay together, probably impacts on rents, things of that nature. So uh, what'd you see in the article? Yeah, so so McKinsey just put out, and I haven't had a chance to digest all of this, uh, but it's called The Future of Work After COVID-19. The full report, the executive summary is 21 pages. The full report is on <laughs> pages. Uh, so I haven't had a oh chance to- Oh my God, to the yeah. executive summary is 21 pages? Well, there's a lot of nice graphs and stuff. Oh, okay, okay. There's Not pictures. All, <laughs> it's, not, yeah, it's, it's very, you know, actually, I would just say this is just a pet peeve. I'm really annoyed because a lot of the images on this, I like to print stuff out and yeah. read it and mark it up. And this, there's like all the, these pages with the, like a black background, uh, which means that like, it's going to use up all my printer ink if I print this thing out to print like, you know, a black. Yeah. I wish that they had a version of this that was just text or whatever, but this is really, so it, it annoys me because I don't like reading on screen. I like reading. I like I'm yeah. old fashioned. I like me too. stuff. I like so, paper. Yep. So, uh, but very interesting article. Uh, you know, the executive summary itself is pretty meaty and it's talking about, you know, COVID-19, the work, the work environment after COVID-19 between now and 2030. And essentially, I mean, it kind of reinforces a lot of what you and I have been talking about over the last year, which is that COVID has really just accelerated trends mm -hmm. that were already in motion but has added a couple of new wrinkles to that. Like d nobody really foresaw the work from home thing happening yeah. because frankly, you know, you and I are old enough to know that ever since the birth of the internet, they've been talking about work from home and it never happened. Nobody wanted to do it. it you know, no, even when video conferencing became really viable, nobody wanted to do it. Uh, so, and it, COVID forced us into that and nobody really foresaw that happening that's going to be uh, but different. But now let's talk about what McKinsey said about the work from home piece. So if you recall last year when COVID started, you know, the, the doomsayers out there basically said, nobody will ever go to an office again. Everyone is going to work remotely. You know, the, all, the whole office sector of the, you know, basically all those office buildings are going to, you know, be vacant forever or they're going to have to be converted to something else. Yeah, uh, and nobody will ever live in a city again. Uh, that was obviously, you know, people's currency bias. Mm -hmm. Immediate, you know, the, the recency bias of COVID uh, was working on people's brains, and they were extrapolating into the fact that nobody was working in offices today indefinitely into the future. Cooler heads like yours and mine thought that this didn't really make a lot of sense, but that there would be some impact. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, McKinsey kind of looked into this issue and they've, they've kind of broken down uh, how much, you know, people are going to be able to actually work from home. Okay. Uh, who's going to, you know, who's going to work from home. And they, what they estimate is that at best about 25% of the workforce is <laughs> going to be able to work from home for more than three days a week. Right. Yeah. That's so, about what I'm hearing too in the, in yeah. the Valley. Yep. So it is, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of people, a lot more than we thought before, sure. uh, but it is not like the end of the office or the downtown business district. Not so, at all. But yeah. it definitely will have an impact on everything. You know, if, if let's say that comes to fruition, which is still remains to be seen, and I'll talk in a second about some of the countervailing forces there. Mm -hmm. um, but if it turns out that 25% of the workforce is only coming into the office a couple of days a week. Obviously that has big impacts for local businesses that depend on office workers, like yeah, good point. You know, restaurants, bars, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that will have a ripple effect through to uh, rents in those yeah. areas, right? That's From you know, retail rents, everything. So th this is, there's some dislocation and pain that is going to be associated with this. And, you know, that could even play through into some real estate opportunity where you've got, you know, people who purchased real estate assets and, you know, downtown core areas where they were expecting to get pretty big, you know, commercial lease rents. Mm -hmm. And now they're not, and they may not be able to pay their debt. Now, a lot of this is going to now depend on whether the banks are willing to take a haircut, you know, the banks, the banks are, 
either going to take one of two positions. One is which one position is pay me. And the other position is we recognize that you can't pay and nobody else will be able to pay either. This is not like you, you know, you, Mr. Landlord, mm -hmm. not being able to run your business right. And we're, we want to, you know, get in somebody who can. Right. This is going to be like, this is just a permanent shift. So what, what do we do? Would you rather, you know, restructure this loan and turn it into a performing loan and write off some of the balance uh, and move on? Or are we going to like go and try to foreclose on this property and then yeah. in this environment? And I, I suspect that a lot of banks are going to choose to restructure if they can. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be all about the operator. It'll be about yeah. the operator. Yeah. I think there's another thing that I'm seeing in this space because I, again, I, I think I've said this before. I live within a mile of some of the largest tech companies yeah. in the world that actually went remote first. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, literally we have a dog park like 50 feet before I'm talking to you now and, and you know, the, just all these tech heads just keep talking. And also Jamie Dimon just the other day came out and basically said, you know, people are coming back to the office. And that's what the Silicon Valley has been saying because uh, the Silicon Valley is, uh, is a very creative environment and you don't get the same of just ebb and flow in creation by everybody talking from their bedrooms. Uh, so they are they are they are anxious to bring people back, and they are already bringing people back quietly now, April, yeah. um, and they they look to probably be. It won't be full, right? They're going to make sure they're not full fully yeah. back, so they can stay below the radar. But I bet you they'll be 75, 80 percent back by Labor Day. Yeah, and I think I, that and that was the example I was going to bring up as like the countervailing example is the is the the that what Jamie Dimon. Said. Oh yeah, he was. Uh, and well, you know, Wall Street is the same as mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. And For I sure. Think most businesses where that are that involve brain work, right, are going to need their people to be in proximity to each other because they're just they're they've lost amazing amounts of productivity because you know. Remember at first people were like, "Oh, I'm so much more productive at home." Yeah, and my boss. I remember that. No, that lasted a couple of months. Yeah. Right? And then what, what started happening was that, well, yeah, you weren't being bothered by people barging into your office and interrupting you or like, you know, the, the meetings and stuff that, you know, that stuff did go away. But what happened was like all of those like chance interactions with people were, you know, you're like, hey, I've got this problem. What do you think about this? Like yeah. all the kind of creative uh, stuff that goes on in an office stopped happening. And so and that's, that's really necessary. Like there's a reason why, you know, the network effects are important and they, yeah. they, that's what happens in, in good businesses, right? You've got smart people solving problems uh, and it doesn't happen on Zoom, right? No, when people just, just want to get off Zoom as quickly as they possibly can. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. You know, it's not the same thing or even picking up the phone, it's not the same thing. It's like when you're, when you're like, Hey, you want to, let's, let's run down and get a sandwich together now. Yeah. Right. Like even if you're not eating together, just that you're walking down to the sandwich place together, waiting on line at the sandwich place, you know, shooting yeah. the breeze. That I, stuff I, is very important. I could not imagine doing my old job in the current environment. One of the things I did for the last five or six years of my sales career is I, I launched products, software products from zero to a hundred million. And the only way you can do something like that is to react fast. Right. The reason we were able to put together go to market plans and change things up as data came in was because we were all the important people were in basically the same place. And I was just thinking while you were going through that, man, if I was if I had to do this all by Zoom, you know, you know how delayed everything would be? What would have been a 30 minute conversation with seven or eight of the smartest people could have took, taken a week and we probably would have lost data because it sat somebody's email and somebody had to do this and somebody had to do that. I mean, I could not imagine running a go-to-market software, you know, going from zero to a hundred million. Oh my God, it would be, it would be impossible in today's environment, frankly. Yeah. But so I think that that, particularly among that kind of like brain work where you require creativity and you require information and news. Speed. You gotta, right. You got to know what other people are thinking about this. That's really important. I think where this is going to really take effect though, is in the kind of more clerical kinds of jobs, right? Where that people don't need to be in office together, right? You call centers, I mean, I, you know, you've probably dealt with lots of people who yeah. used to work in call centers who are now doing it from home. Mm -hmm. The tech kind of sucks, 
but I'm sure that will be improved over time. That will sure. be better. Um, a lot of those people are going to, and for, for a lot of those people working from home makes a lot of sense because they, they don't have to burn time commuting to an office to be on the phone. Better quality of life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They can be on the phone at home or you've got like, you know, you don't need to have your, you know, payroll processing people like sharing ideas with each other because they're yeah. just processing the stuff. Right. So a lot of that back office stuff may wind up either getting remote or the other thing that McKinsey pointed out is satellite offices, right? They may just, they may yeah, just little hubs. That, that trend towards, you know, breaking down the big office in a big expensive location. You know, that there was always some of that, right? Like yeah. after 9-11, a lot of financial firms moved their back offices to New Jersey because, I remember. because they were afraid of another terrorist attack and they wanted to diversify and then like build in redundancy, right? Yep. But that same kind of, because they realized, well, these people don't have to be on Wall Street. They can yeah. be in New Jersey, right? It's cheaper and, right over there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then once they made that, then they were like, oh, well then they could actually, they could be in Charlotte, right? They don't have to yeah. even be in New Jersey, right? right. So I think you'll see that trend continue to accelerate. And you know what? I think that's investable. I mean, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think that is absolutely investable. Like if you're in, if you're in one of these cities that I've been following, like Nashville, just to pick on Nashville, you could actually go create almost like a WeWork space, but not that in Nashville for like HR offices or payroll or, you know, those clerical back office jobs. I mean, that, that, that's an investable trend, I think. it absolutely is. And then the people moving there for those jobs. And so this is, so one of the things that this McKinsey report also talks about is that while the major cities like New York and San Francisco and London, and, you know, even places like Dallas, you know, we always hear like, oh, Texas, the Texas miracle, Dallas got whacked, like the big cities in Texas, Austin got mm-hmm. whacked, you know, but across everywhere, the small cities have, have done really well. So surprising places like one of the hot, the biggest rent bump places in the US was Rochester, New York, right? Mm-hmm. Who would have thought, yeah. right? But places like that, smaller cities that sort of like are big enough to have what you want in a city without being overwhelming in terms of like the cost of living and stuff like a lot of other big cities are or commute times or what have you, uh, they benefited a lot from from COVID. So mm-hmm. in terms of rent growth and what have you, and even off, even office rent growth, that's that's the really interesting, even wow. office rents were an office vacancies, you know. In Rochester, New York, that's in some in, in smaller cities around the country because of this. So uh, that trend is something that they, that McKinsey forecasts will, will, con- will continue. Interesting. Um, I, I think the, I think, you know, one thing I haven't seen in here yet, but I, I I don't know if it's in there or not, but just thinking about this issue, I think, you know, for the the whole, so we've seen this trend of like suburbanization over the last, you know, year. No question. Certainly some of that will be permanent, right? But yeah, you know, for the, and like we talked about before, the people who already had it in mind, like, or, you know, maybe in a lot of cases were like putting off moving to the suburbs because they just didn't want to, then COVID kind of put them yeah. over the or put them over the edge, yeah. right? So we saw a lot of that happening, maybe compressing in over, you know, in, into a shorter period of time, stuff that was going to happen anyway. Um, but I, I think one of the things that's all, that's also that people need to think about is that at least for young people and also for some people with families who can afford it, even if they are not in the office, it doesn't mean that they want to be far from their job because they still have to commute, right? If they're going in three days a week or four yeah. days a week, they still have to, and they're not going to like move to some place, you know, like in New York, New York City. You can move up to the Hudson Valley, which is beautiful and more affordable and whatever. And there's trains to New York, but like, you might not really want to be getting on the train for like an hour, an hour and a half each direction. Yeah, to, that's what that's what I've always to thought. Job four days a week, right? Yeah. Like, it's still a pain. So even if so, you maybe you're working one day a week or two days a week, but you're doing it from your apartment three blocks from your office, right? You're just yeah. not going into the office. So that's what I've often thought about this whole thing: suburbanization. We'll use your example, the Hudson Valley. I was always thinking, what's the breakoff point? I'm like, one day a week. Like, if I had to go in on Wednesdays for my series of internal meetings, would that be enough for me to get on a train once a week? Probably right? The other four days, right? You make it basically what I was thinking Wednesday is like, okay, now I got six days at home, right? Yeah. 
And I'm like, okay, what about two days? I'm like, maybe I'm like three days. Nope. I'm going to, I'm going to move six blocks away. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, I think that's exactly what I would say. I could do two days, like two days would be okay to have that long a commute. But once you get to three, nah. then you're like, this is really kind of getting onerous, right? So, um, you know, unless you could do it three days in a row, I don't know, maybe there's some way you could manage it. But nah, three, time, three is over. Certainly by the time you get to four, oh, you know, you forget to about it to, to work. And then and then by the time you're working four days a week, you're probably just going to go in the fifth day anyway, right? It's yeah. Like, it's like, like, ah. we, all, we all know we've all seen this the, the person who's like supposed to be working part-time right and then you know six months later they're complaining because you know they're like i'm actually getting paid part-time and i'm working full-time you know? yeah I, it's like exactly. you know yeah. so they i think the same thing is going to happen people as soon as the covid thing recedes yep and and, and listen people have short memories right so yeah um i i think that in a couple of years, like once people get used to being in close spaces with other people, they get used to not wearing masks, you know, it's going to be, they'll forget all about it. I mean, yep. I remember having this conversation with a bunch of other real estate guys here in New York after Hurricane Sandy, when lower Manhattan got completely flooded, the power stations got flooded with salt water, they all went out. Mm. It was like horrendous. The subway shut down. I remember all the tubes got flooded with water. And, and everybody was like, you know, is anybody going to, you know, and on the news, it was all like, is anybody going to live in Manhattan again ever after this? And we had, we had our first kind of, you know, networking event not too long after that. And we kind of went around the table and said, uh, you know, what is the long lasting effect of, of Sandy on real estate in New York? And it was unanimous that there was going to be zero effect mm. of Sandy on real estate in New York because everybody would have forgotten about it in six months. And that's actually what turned out to be, to be the case, yeah. right? So maybe COVID will have a longer lasting effect because we've had to deal with it for such a long time. And kind of we've had yeah, it's, yeah. habits as a result. But I, I think once we go back to normal, it'll be back to normal. And so that's, you know, you'll see the trend yeah. coming back. One other thing on this point I wanted to make was that uh, I was reading the other day that uh, according to New York City realtors, the... Uh, New York is going to return to net inflow of renters this month. Wow. That's big news. Yeah. So, you know, the drop off in rents has been so substantial that it is now pulled in a whole new group of people who are obviously different from the people who moved out. Yep. Or maybe some of them are coming back, but there's, you're now having uh, lease up is accelerated and uh, the trend is now going back towards absorption rather than uh, negative absorption. So that's good news. Yeah. So that is all, that's all good news. That'll help. You know, Very cool. Cost it. So. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I look forward to episode number three, which is one I actually talked about on my daily financial news, uh, which is zoning laws. So I look forward to your thoughts on that. Thanks, buddy. Cool.